I'm going to talk about irrigation restrictions on, on crop acreage, uh, mainly talking about the alluvial aquifer and how uh, water levels, groundwater levels are declining. And then uh, kind of say, uh, if that situation would unfold, what would happen to irrigation intensive crops like rice and what would happen to processing industries. I'm not going to talk about the processing industries, but you know, those ones are at, at risk. And then I want to say, okay, I've been doing a bunch of work on biofuels. What if we were to introduce some alternative crops that are less irrigation intensive compared to rice or, or various other crops? And then see uh, at what price levels those bioenergy crops would have to come in to kind of offset the irrigation, uh, the irrigation restriction effects or the effects of, of losing groundwater. And then, uh, uh, and then kind of play out where some of this stuff would happen in the state of Arkansas and what the net income uh, ramifications of that would be. So what uh, uh, Lanier and I did is we developed a model of Arkansas crop agriculture. And we said, if we really want to capture some of these spatial effects, then we've got a model, you know, county by county what's going on in Arkansas. And we need to look at all the crops and then see how relative changes in some of those crops would affect overall returns to the state and to a particular region. So we've got all the major crops in there, irrigated and dry land. And then we've got forage sorghum, which is a photoperiod sensitive uh, grain sorghum that basically focuses most of the production season on vegetative growth. So it is a high biomass producer, and by biomass I mean just cellulose or green plants, that you could then uh, ultimately convert to energy. Uh, but that crop uh, is an annual crop, can be grown dry land or irrigated. Uh, if you irrigate it or put more fertilizer on it, you're going to get more production uh, versus the switchgrass, which is a perennial. Uh, and uh, you would fertilize uh, switchgrass less, but at the same time also get uh, less yield. And you also wouldn't uh, irrigate it. We also got hay and pasture land in there. What we tried to do is we tried to keep hay and pasture acres to such a level where livestock producers wouldn't be affected by this, by this scenario. And then we've got CRP acreage in there, and we constrained the model by saying, okay, historically we're harvesting so much acreage uh, for each crop, and we're doing so much irrigation uh, to kind of capture some of these socioeconomic things, limitations, so that we don't get a situation where we say, okay, we're going to cut irrigation out, and all of a sudden rice acres are going to go to zero. That's sort of unrealistic. So we, uh, uh, we kind of constrained the model that way. And then we looked at those cost of production budgets that Jeff had already talked about and Lanier talked about and we captured all the fertilizer, water, labor and fuel use and, uh, and also did the carbon stuff and said okay of all the production budgets that are out there that are being published by the Cooperative Extension uh, Service we can go ahead and differentiate those cost of production budgets by the ones that are actually being used in different regions of the state. And so we put that restriction on there and then we said, okay, each acre for each crop can generate so much revenue and uh, subtract costs out of that. And then we can overall maximize the profit potential for Arkansas to crop production, right? In, in one simple model. It's not so simple actually, but we could figure then out which crop in which county makes the most money and then allocate the most acres to it within limits, okay? And then because we captured fuel and fertilizer and irrigation water use, we could then say, well, if we're not allowed to pump as much out of the alluvial aquifer uh, because groundwater levels are declining, uh, well, how would that profitability of the state be affected by that, okay? And so is irrigation water really declining? Well, we looked at the 1997 USGS uh, uh, groundwater uh, level use rates and uh, their estimates of what would be sustainable, in other words, what would maintain the groundwater level if we used the 1997 alluvial aquifer estimates from USGS. And what they said back then, is they said uh, in Arkansas County, for example, we'd have to reduce irrigation water use by 43% for groundwater levels no longer to decline. So 57% of current irrigation water use would be sustainable. Well, they've been tracking this groundwater level use and uh, in uh, 2006 USGS numbers, you can see kind of the same, the same sort of scenario, except now Arkansas is down, Arkansas County is down to 49%. So if you want to compare between 1997 and 2006, you can see that, you know, we see a whole lot more red 
and more red means more irrigation restriction using the 2006 USGS numbers. Okay, how does that play out in terms of crop allocation then? Well, for the alluvial region, which are the highlighted uh, counties in there, uh, we've got uh, different crops grown, and here's the, the legend to that. Corn is sort of the, the yellowish green, irrigated cotton is the white, irrigated soybeans is the, the bright green, rice is brown, and then dry land crops, and hay is, is the red stuff. Okay, total is about six and a half million acres in the in the alluvial region, of which 4.4 million uh, acres are irrigated. That's the baseline, without groundwater irrigation restrictions. So we're saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and solve the model and let it optimize on the basis of uh, of no limitations on irrigation restrictions. And so the different size of the circles represents different uh, amounts of crop acreage, and then the breakdown of the circle gives you the different crops. And then we said, well, let's go ahead and restrict it, okay, see what happens. If we go to sustainable, the immediate thing that ought to pop out at you if you follow a circle, for example, in Mississippi County, is that there's more red, more dryland agriculture. No water, got to go to dryland, right? Makes sense. But you can also go ahead and look at Mississippi County, for example, and see a little bit of yellow for corn in, in Mississippi County. In 2007, it's no longer there. If you look at Arkansas County, we're reducing some rice acreage. Okay, so there's things happening with those irrigation restrictions. But then we said, okay, we might also go not from irrigate as much as you're currently doing to fully sustainable irrigation. We might go halfway between because people are putting on on-farm reservoirs and using surface water more efficiently, doing all kinds of other things. I mean, there's alternatives. As things change, you, you move with the change, right? And so if you, if you restricted the groundwater use to somewhere between 50% of between the 2007 baseline and the fully sustainable scenario, <coughs> and then the crop al allocation might look as, as that. And uh, what does that now mean in terms of economics for net returns to crop production in Arkansas? If you go to full restriction, the alluvial region net returns to crop production declined by 38%. For the state, it's 33% because not all counties are affected by irrigation water shortages. And if you go to with a 50% restriction of water use, we drop by 21% and 19% for the state. Now that's using 2007 prices and 2007 cost of production numbers. While 2007 prices may have been high, cost of production numbers may not have been all that super high, there's, there's things that can change. So don't take those numbers to the graveyard and say, Pop said, you know, returns are going to drop by 38%. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to happen. But now the meat of this uh, analysis is, what if we were to introduce some of these biomass crops, these alternative energy crops, to make green material cellulose for eventual production to ethanol uh, or bioenergy uh, kind of scenarios. As I've mentioned earlier, We've got switchgrass in there. We modeled uh, dry matter yields of 4.8, 4.2, and 3.8 dry tons per acre on different types of land. And uh, forage sorghum, uh, even on dry land, yields higher than that, but requires some more fertilizer uh, and, uh, and things of that nature. Okay? And then uh, those biomass conversion numbers, I just put those up there. They're going to come into the, into the scenario a little bit later. Here's that 50% scenario again. But now, using the 2007 crop prices and a biomass price for switchgrass at $52.28. Now, why in the heck did I put $52.28 as the biomass price? That's the price that I need to return state level returns for the whole state back to pre irrigation restriction levels uh, to, uh, you know, to, to reduce the income effect for the entire state. And 52.28 per dry ton also has some implications for ethanol price and, and all the other kind of stuff. I'll talk about that later. But what I want you to focus in on now is, again, these crop circles. Okay, almost 1.9 million acres of these biomass crops, and a lot of them in this non-irrigated biomass and principally in forage sorghum, but a little bit of switchgrass in there as well, and some irrigated biomass production too. If you go to 100% sustainable, that blue gets even bigger, almost 3 million acres. 
out of six and a half million acres out of the baseline that we talked about in 2007. Here's the biomass acreage response. I put this graph up there to show you that under the baseline scenario with, uh, with uh, price levels ranging from $25 to $50 per dry ton, we can see some acres going into that production. And a lot of it will come into the alluvial region. So it's not going to be non-crop acres or pasture acres as much as 25, uh, 2.5 million acres. If you increase the, uh, the irrigation sustainability scenarios, you could shoot up to uh, statewide close to, 4 million, close to 4 million acres. The reason why I put that graph up there is to show that most of that, at least according to my model situations, uh, is going to come out of forage sorghum or this dedicated energy crop that you uh, go ahead and fertilize to get more biomass yield. Here's the same sort of scenario for the Delta region, 25, 35, 45, and 55 dollars uh, for the price of switchgrass. The sustainability scenario for irrigation, this is the number of thousands of acres that would be in the crop, both irrigated and non-irrigated, not a whole lot of irrigated forage sorghum, but a whole bunch of dry land uh, forage sorghum. And here's the ethanol price that if we use Wallace's 2005 projections of $1.46 per gallon for processing and 78.3 gallons per dry ton of biomass yield, this is the ethanol price that would, would result for these different prices. Now I said, for the state to return to pre-irrigation restriction levels, we were somewhere between $52 and $54 per dry ton. That's somewhere between $2.05 and $2.11 per gallon of, of ethanol. And that roughly competes with about $100 to $105 crude oil. And if we get all of this happening, and that's a big if, we could produce as much as 1.9 billion gallons of ethanol if full irrigation restrictions were to come about. The point of the presentation is that alternative crops are going to play a role in the future. Irrigation water is declining and you have to find alternative sources. Either quit pumping out of the ground, but that has pretty nasty income ramifications, or invest in on-farm water storage and tailwater recovery systems to increase your efficiency for water use. Nonetheless, we can expect probably some pretty significant spatial income redistributions.